Hello, everyone. Hello. Good, uh, good afternoon. Uh, this is actually uh, this is my second speech in Canada. The first one I did was through Skype, and now it's physical. So it's like my first time in Canada. I'm so excited. And it's actually pretty interesting that um, my, my passport is going to expire soon, and I'm glad the Canadian authorities let me in. Um, I mean, my, my passport is as valid probably as my country. Uh, so I, I don't really know if, uh, if my expiration date for the passport and the day that Iraq is probably gone is actually on the same date. Um, I mean, when I, I still remember when I left Iraq back in 2009, end of 2009, um, I had uh, like mixed feelings whether I, it, it was a goodbye just for, for Iraq or like goodbye that I'm just going to leave Iraq or goodbye that Iraq is not going to exist anymore. And I'm now more inclined to believe that this is going to be the case. So the, the speech is a bit going to be uh, a bit depressing, probably maybe the most depressing speech you will hear in this conference. Um, but um, I think that the issue is getting more and more complicated than I thought it was. I, I started being active um, roughly when I was like 15 years old, when it was the first Iraqi elections. And I was mainly afraid that after the Saddam Hussein is gone, there is going to be um, a huge sectarian conflict and huge revenge from the Shia majority folks who have been prosecuted for a very long time by, um, by Saddam and, and, and what, what is also known as the Sunni Saddam, because it's, it's very important to make, a, uh, to make that clear. And um, I started advocating for what I thought, and I definitely still think, is the best rule, uh, which is secularism, which in which people from all different faiths, or no faith at all, can live together in peace, equal under the law. And it's, sometimes it's really depressing to know that I've always been right. It is one of, one of the things that I seriously don't want to be right about, is that I didn't really want to see my country, um, or should I say my country of birth, because I identify as a globalist, is, uh, is to see it destroyed by what I've always thought of as the excess of evil. And, and I think that Bush got it wrong, what is really the excess of evil. And the excess of evil, in my opinion, is... Saudi Arabia, Iran, and Pakistan. And Iraq, Syria, Lebanon are being a battlefield for all these evil powers that want to impose their own version of Islam on the rest of us. And, we need, and I, I was one of the few people who stood, stood up against that, and I'm really proud of it. I think it, it is something that everybody should do. And my work is mostly focused, I mean, I, I kind of took a a bit of a break from giving speeches to what I refer to uh, uh, sympathetic groups, uh, like, like here, uh, which like most people agree that there's no God. Okay, let's, let's move on. Um, uh, because this is really what I, like there are people who are much more qualified than I am to talk about that subject, but what I, I can really see what my, my push and my pitch, I would say, um, is to fight against and support those who are living in close societies, including the ones that I grew up in. I mean, the way I see Islamic extremism, um, like, what, what I, like we can see ISIS and Boko Haram and Al-Qaeda, who are now the liberals compared to ISIS. So imagine, so imagine like the leader of Al-Qaeda saying, these ISIS guys are too crazy. <laughs> so, so imagine how fucked up, sorry. Um, <laughs> The situation is, is to the way that Al Qaeda considers ISIS to be extreme, and like ISIS, like also the head of the Nostra group just a few days ago, he said we have to be rational about it. We have to be calm down. We should not attack the West. So we'd be like, oh wow, Al Qaeda are now the new liberals. They're like, wow, that's. Uh, and I consider myself old school. Like when I say I used to live around Al Qaeda, I'm like new old school. Like I lived with the moderates, you know. Like now there's uh, seems like. Pretty, uh, it went, situation went pretty bad. But all of these groups, like whether they are in Southeast Asia, whether in, in, in the Middle East, the way I see them is they are, they are AIDS, not HIV. 
is that they're the symptom, not the disease. And I'm focusing focused more on curing HIV. Because I really think that the HIV is the ideology that is feeding these terrorist groups. Is that we can we can ruin, destroy Al Qaeda tomorrow with, with a huge, huge military power, etc. But I can assure you that there is a new Al Qaeda going to pop up the next day, and probably much worse than Al Qaeda that we were expecting. Because I, Al Qaeda is an ideology. It's more the, the, the members of Al Qaeda is just as the symptom of, a, of, an, ideologi of an ideological support that I, they have been getting from countries around the region, and this ideology is the, is the ideology that needs to be defeated. We cannot, in my opinion, defeat terrorism without addressing the main roots of the problem. And um, so, so my, my work, I mean, I've been working uh, for about a year so far with a project started by Google, Google Ideas. Um, it's called movements.org, and the, the whole uh, project, and now squared by an organization called Advanced Human Rights, is that the whole project is focused on how, the question is what can we do about it? Because I can, I can go on and on about the problems and, and I can go on and on about stories and this is what happened, and this is what happened, this is what I've been through, but I don't really think that is what's really important. What's really important is what's next. Because there, we can go all over the media and see this is a problem, this is what's going on, um, but my focus has always been is on what's next. And considering that I think that w we know at least major, what is really the major problem is that, is that the, the, the war on terror is an ideological war. It's not, it's not a war against individuals. The individuals are, just resemble this ideology. And the, the, one of the solutions, I don't really claim to know the final solution, uh, and I think the ones who claim to know the final solution has actually brought so much damage to this planet. Um, is that one of the solutions is to create some sort of solidarity movement between those who live in free societies, like I am at the moment, and so are you, and those who are living in closed societies, like Bangladesh, like Pakistan, like Iraq, like Syria, um, assuming that this country is going to exist, but even just the land by itself, is that what can, we, what can people in the free world do? So we created a system, which is we call the Match.com for Human Rights. Um, and in which people, just like Match.com, somebody's looking for, for uh, somebody to love or somebody to hook up with. Um, it's um, it's on, on the other side, there are people who offer help. There are people pr who can fill a form, who say, you know what, I'm a graphic designer, I'm a translator, I'm an editor, etc. And on the other side, there are people who are living in closed societies who say, I'm requesting an editor, I'm requesting a translator, I'm trust requesting, uh, and then we match them. And, w and to be honest, we're, like, we're still, compared to how many requests we have on the website, compared to how many people asking for help, we're not really doing much. And I can, I can be completely honest about it because there is hundreds of thousands of people looking for uh, to escape. There are hundreds of thousands looking for people, uh, looking for any type of help. But we can do it. We can do it because the many people say, well, why should I care? Like, why, why, what's, what's going on over there? It's too far away. Um, it's, not, uh, it's not my business. But at the same time, if you are not interested in the Middle East, the Middle East is interested in you. And the, the ideologies that is feeding Al-Qaeda and ISIS and, and so on are not focused on the region. They, the, all of them, they have a clear mission to establish a global Islamic caliphate. And we have seen, I mean, the incidents of 7-7 in London and 9-11 and Boston bombing and so on. And now there are a lot of recruits happening in our midst here in the West. Like where I live in the East Coast in New York and there was like about three miles, four miles away, there were members of ISIS. And, and, and they capture them. Like, it's, it's no longer about the Middle East. The Middle East is where the war is mostly happening and where things are, are, are mostly condensed, just like Manhattan, but, the, but it's not really, it's, it's expanding. It's no longer about the region. Why, that's why people in the West mostly should care. Because I don't really appeal to charity. I appeal to individual interest. And that's pretty much, uh, and I think it's pretty reasonable 
to appeal to that b uh, because everybody is looking at the Middle East and say, what the hell is going on over there? Like, I, 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 you, ne you never know who's the ally and who's the enemy anymore. And, uh, but there are our allies, and our allies are those who stand up for the same values we stand for. And we, we do not need to, it's not really imposition. I get a lot of these comments uh, about, oh, we are trying to impose liberal values. Many people don't think that, don't realize that this is actually a racist statement to say. When you think that, that liberalism or like w women are equal human beings, it's just actually white people believe in that. It, 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 is, it, is, it is pretty racist to assume that, to assume that principle, is that these values are universal. And what's happening, unfortunately, within many of the far left, I don't know pretty much about Canada, but I know about the United States, is that pretty, the, the far left has sided with the Muslims, with the, with the Muslim rights against their fellow liberals, which is pretty shameful. Like, those of us who are liberal, who, who are secular from the Middle East, are actually get hate from two sides that you never thought that they are allies, who are the Islamists on one side and the left on the other. And, and, and you, you realize how hypocritical that is. Like, you see somebody who's like, I support gay marriage, I support m women equality, but I also believe that Islam is the origin of peace. And you would be like, what the hell did you just say? Uh, <laughs> what the hell did you just say? And at the same time, they, they go crazy about the Christian right. They go crazy about the Republicans. Look at them, look at the Republicans. They are trying to oppose gay marriage. They are bigots, they are uh, fools, they are idiots, blah, blah, blah. And then you tell them, well, if, if you put a standard that if anybody opposes gay marriage is a, is a, is a bigot, then you just called 99% of Muslims bigots. You just did. But there is, there is a racism that's not really much talked about. Um, because most of the racism is talked about if there is a white person killing a, a person of color, that's all racism. But when there is a racism that's, that's, that is shaped in a very postmodern way, it's called, in my opinion, it's called, uh, or Ali coined this term, it's called the bigotry of lower expectations. Is that you, you have lots of liberals in, in the United States who would say, oh well, that's their culture and we should respect it. And, and, and I always like to remind them, why don't you say the same thing about people in the Midwest, for example? If somebody in the Midwest says, I oppose gay marriage, you don't say, oh, that's their culture and they should respect it. But if it's a brown guy saying it, no. We don't want to be racist. There, there is, there is the, racist, the Islamophobia phobia. I call it the Islamophobia phobia. There are more people afraid of being phobic about perceived as Islamophobic than actually caring about the human rights. And, and we should call out these people because, because these, I think that this weird and holy alliance that's happening between the left and the Islamists is a pretty dangerous. And, and it's dangerous because it allows only those on the crazy far right to talk about the subject. Like, if, if you look at people like Pamela Geller, like, I despise Pamela Geller. Like, people like her, who are on the far right, uh, cr Christian or J Jewish right, they, they believe Obama is a Kenyan, and he's a secret Muslim, and uh, all of this so much baggage and bullshit that they believe in, and then, and, th and they are the ones who are the only ones standing up. Unfortunately, they are the, the only loud ones who are standing up against Islamic extremism. And we are not, we are, we are left, at, left at without any reasonable discussion about the Islamic doctrine and the concepts of jihad and martyrdom. And we are left alone. And those of us who speak about it are either called Uncle Toms, or either called racist, or either called, oh well, he's self-hating brown person. And I receive that all the time, not, not from, you would assume, from the Muslims, but actually from the left. They will, they will say, oh, you have been indoctrinated by Western ideals. Now you think that women are equal? You have been indoctrinated. What the hell? <laughs> like, you, you would assume that, like, like you, you, sometimes like, I cannot really comprehend the, like, like the words that come out of their mouth. Like, how, how, what, did, what did you just say? Um, so that is, that is actually, I think it's a, it's a big issue that, that it's like two issues I'm, I'm trying to address here is that, is that there is a need for those of us in the, in the, in the free world who, who are liberals and secularists to stand with our fellow human beings in the Middle East and, and fellow liberals in the Middle East. And there is the problem with the left, they're trying to shift the problem 
into or uh, trying to divert from the problem, and we need to bring them back to talk about this subject. I, I don't want to focus a lot of time on Q&A, but uh, I would like to thank you for inviting me. And uh, may science and reason bless you, and may science and reason bless Canada. Thank you. All right, brevity is definitely a virtue. All right, any questions for Faisal? No, are we all like scared? All right. <laughs> all right. No, no. Oh, okay, sorry. So, um, you think Iraq is right now in the situation in Iraq? Do you think the situation in Iraq right now? Do you think the three-state solution is a feasible? Um, um, answer to the problem in Iraq right now? Basically, for the people that don't know, basically dividing Iraq into a Kurdish, a Sunni, and a Shia area. Yeah. Um, actually, there's a, a great article by The Onion um, uh, <laughs> that, that says, like, the best solution for the Middle East is a 300 million state solution, uh, <laughs> which is actually closer to the truth than you would think. Um, it's... Um, I mean, that, that is... That is I think it's a possibility, but um, I think I mean, I mean I can assure Kurdistan that is probably getting closer to an independent state than uh, we would think. But and they have been pushing for it for a very long time since the, the first Gulf War. The now the rest is 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 where the issue is is the Sunni Shia conflict, and the Sunni Shia conflict goes beyond just Iraq. So the and, and also, there's discussion about resources. When you have, because the, when it comes to Iraq, most of the oil is actually in the Shia areas. The Sunni areas don't have any, a lot of oil and don't have a lot of resources. And uh, but these resources are needed for their survival. So they will not. I mean, look at both sides of who are fighting at now at the moment. Both of them do not believe in that solution. Both of them want to impose their own views on the, on the other side. It's like you, 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 the, the Islamic State, or ISIS, or uh, the Mormon State, as some liberals want to call it, um, it's, uh, it's, not, it's not going to be satisfied by the areas they're controlling at the moment. They really want to establish a global Islamic caliphate. They're not going to stop by saying, oh, well, if you're going to look at the sykes picos agreement, which actually divided all most of the Middle East after World War I, um, they are, uh, they, they are not going to be satisfied by like, oh, this is your land and this is our land. And uh, it's just like, for example, Hamas. Hamas is not going to be satisfied by two-state solution with Israelis. I mean, they really want to wipe out Israel out of the map. Uh, and when you cannot have a, a conversation with folks like ISIS. I mean, I've tried. Uh, didn't work out well. And... Um, and you can actually try by yourself. I mean, you, if, you, if you go to Twitter, I, I, would, I, I'm, I give a credit to my enemies, and I would say that the social, the social marketing strategy of ISIS is one of the best in the world. They're even better than the State Department. They're even better than, like, they have public relations firms working. If there is a hashtag Ask ISIS. You can go actually ask ISIS on Twitter, what do they think about this subject? And they can, you can get a response faster than Barack Obama. Like, you would get a response within two minutes of people from all over the world who speak five languages can answer your questions immediately about exactly what they think and exactly what their mission and they have the best media strategy ever. Like we really are one of the people who actually learns from the enemies and they, and they are not going to be, and you can, you can ask them the question, are you going to be satisfied with controlling Mosul and uh, Kirkuk and, and the Sunni part? They will say no. So, but, but, the, but, the, but the issue is, if there is an alternative in which ISIS popular support is not going to be common within the areas they control. And I think that the, that, that the popularity of ISIS does not come only because they are Muslims or they are, they are an Islamic state. There is, there is a, after the, the, the US invasion and we had the Iraqi government, and which I'm not really a fan of, um, they have been discriminating against the Sunnis for a very long time. They came with revenge. And, and that is an issue, is that when you, you have a lot of folks right now who are, I would, say, I would count them as 
okay, moderate Muslims, even though I don't like to use the term, but, but uh, moderate Muslims who, who would, if they get the choice between ISIS and Iraqi government, they would choose ISIS for survival because they know that the government is going to discriminate and kill them. So, so a, lot, a lot of the folks in, within the ISIS-controlled areas are stuck in that choice. So if you're going to, and that is also Obama's vision to some extent, is that if you're going to change the Iraqi government and try to create a more equal, more, um, um, I would say, compassionate to minorities, you would, uh, you would see a change within, within the ISIS-controlled areas. You're going to have revolutions against them. Because, yes, they do have popular support, but they don't have 100% popular support. And I would say it's less than 50%. So, what's next? Um, and also you have Syria, which is like they're pretty connected to each other. So, if, if there is going to be a three-state solution, or probably five-state solution, it's, it's gonna, not going to be only Iraq divided into three parts. There is, there's possibility that Syria is going to be divided into three parts as well, and the areas that are Sunni-Sunni is going to mix together, and Shia-Shia are going to mix together, and then the Kurdish region is going to mix together. So you're going to have probably three different states uh, that go just beyond the Iraqi borders. They're going to go, uh, and that's, uh, that, I, I, to be honest, I'm, I'm stuck in the middle. I don't know if, if, if it's this thing, possible position is going to happen or the war is going to continue. Um, I mean, I, I think that both options are pretty terrible. Uh, it's like whatever, you, whatever the conclusion that comes out of the end of ISIS, it's, I think that ISIS has already won. Is that they destroyed enough architecture, they killed a lot of lives. It's, yes, I mean, they're going to be defeated one day, but uh, after what? After, after so many grieving mothers, after so many, of, uh, much of Iraq and Syrian history has been wiped out. So it's it, like the law, we have to admit the loss anyway. And uh, yeah, so I'm stuck in the middle. Maybe, maybe that's, that's a possible solution if the conflict is going to continue. And uh, we will see. Um, my question I have is, um, the Islam religion is not based on peace. So if I want to start that conversation, what next? I actually had a friend of mine, when I wanted to speak up about it, she said, Denise, your safety. You know, and, and you're saying a couple miles from where you were in New York, there, there was ISIS there. Like, that's here in our front door. So if you want to speak up, I'm pretty helpless. I don't carry guns. I don't carry a knife. So what's next for me? If I want to make a difference, where do I start? Yeah, I mean, I mean the question of safety um, is, a, is a pretty... It's, I, I, like, I really get disappointed uh, when I move to the West thinking that the danger is no longer there. And then I moved, like, a week after I moved to the United States, uh, two weeks probably, was the Boston bombing. Like, I, I arrived in March 2013, and the Boston bombing happened two weeks after. And I said, seems like uh, I didn't really survive much. <laughs> Maybe the, the danger is still here. And, and, and it's also, a very, uh, I would say, kind of a difference between the danger is that in Iraq, you'll always expect it to be dead. Like, you never know that you're going to survive when you go to high school and come back. Uh, so you're always cautious. Like, you're always thinking that somebody's going to get you. Um, in, in the West, you have the illusion that everything is okay and everything is safe. And then out of a sudden, boom, uh, something happens. But um, here, is, here is, I think, what, you, what, you, what we, we can do. I, I mean, the, the, the people who are against Islamic extremism in the West are more than the Islamic extremists. Like, we, we outnumber them pretty much. It's just that we need to stop being apologetics for Islamic extremism in the West. And we... we um, so so th that is one thing. I mean, look at, for example, Charlie Hebdo, uh, the recent attack. I, I really applaud the Washington Post, for example, for republishing the cartoons. The Huffington Post republished the cartoons. The New York Times did not. And, and then they go on and say this is hate speech. L no, they didn't say that about Charlie Hebdo, but they said that about the, about the last like, incident in, in Texas. Um, is that we have, to be st we have to stop apologizing for Islamic service. We ha we, we, like, you go on and on, ab like many people in the media, they will say, oh, it's, it's nothing but Islam. It's nothing but Islam. Like, like I, I go with them. Like, I, I give speeches. I, I, I spoke in Colombia and so many other universities. And I say, what can I 
what can ISIS convince you that they are motivated by Islam? What evidence should I give you to th that they are telling you every day they are motivated by Islam? And then you see the, the leftists, they say, no, they're not motivated by Islam. They're motivated by economics and foreign policy. I was like, I was like what, what evidence does ISIS need to give you to, prove, to tell you that they are not motivated by what you just said? And they will say, no, it's, it's, it's still foreign policy and George W. Bush. And this is, this is, I think, what needs to change. And it has to be done through our movements. It has to be within, within an organized movement within, within the liberals in, in the West who, who say, we are done with this shit. We, we have to, th these are our values, and, 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 and these values, we respect them because they work. Equality for women is a good idea. Uh, <laughs> gay rights is a good idea. We have to stand up and stop apologizing in the name of multiculturalism. Humans have rights. Cultures, ideas, and beliefs don't have rights. And we have to stand up for human rights. Wow, you cover a whole lot of areas here. First of all, I want to say as a lifelong leftist, I appreciate your comments about people who support progressive causes in their own country, but support reactionary causes in other countries, in particular the Middle East. Um, I, I note that a lot of um, the leadership of ISIS uh, were Ba'athists under Saddam Hussein, and I would like I would like your comments on the evolution of of the Ba'athist movement uh, uh, and how this evolved into something like ISIS. Yeah, uh, that's good. Thank you, thank you, fellow leftists. Um, is that? Uh, well, I mean, ISIS comes from all over the place. There are, there are members even from Canada flying all over to join ISIS. Like, ISIS is not really only an Iraqi organization. It's a global one. They have people coming from Belgium, France, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, who probably never heard of the Ba'athist Party. Um, so, yes, but the, their base is, is in areas that used to be controlled by the Ba'athist Party. And that happened to some extent as a false uh, knowledge by the Americans about dismantling the Iraqi army. Um, and, and that is, and, I mean, it's, 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 it was a guess. And, and like the, sometimes you make guesses and they all they do, they turn very bad. Um, is that you have, Sad like Saddam Hussein, life under Saddam Hussein, I, I, I mean, I'm glad I didn't live that long under Saddam Hussein, but um, calling him a monster is probably a compliment, okay? And most of these dictatorships, the Iraq wa was like a prison, okay, like a pretty much a prison under Saddam Hussein. And the moment you got Saddam Hussein out, a prison with all his junk got out of it. Like this is this is a situation. This is a chaos that was created after a huge dictatorship was was removed. And uh, you have the the revenge-based Shia militias and the revenge-based governments uh, that adds up to the already pissed off people who are the Sunnis who have been ruling the country for a very long time. So, so I mean, it doesn't really take, the, many people say like, oh, how did you get death threats from Al-Qaeda and stuff? I'm like, well, it's, it's not really hard work. <laughs> trust me, like, like, trust me, it's not really hard work. It's not really hard work to get somebody from the Ba'athist party to join ISIS. It's, it doesn't really take much. Like, you don't really need to uh, create a genocide for that to happen. They, they can. If they see that they have been con in control for, for a very long time and they used to have all these privileges that uh, I can get a bigger salary than anyone else, I can live my life the way I want to, and then out of a sudden all of this power taken out of them, and then more to act, add more to that is more discrimination from the Shia government. So, so see the, so the ISIS is, a, is, a, is a, I call it the toxic mix. It's not like only a result of let's say Islam, or the result of Saddam. It's, it's the whole geopolitics, internal politics, religion, came all together to produce that giant. And that giant is, is, I would say, that it's expanding in terms of its ideological extremism, because these conditions are still there. Internal domestic government, that is a failure. Geopolitics, civil wars all over the region. 
continuous fear, and then you are, you are, we're having much more extremism. So I, as I said, like Al-Qaeda in 2007 are now the moderates compared to ISIS. And, and with more, more of these wars continuing, you're gonna have a bigger giant than ISIS to deal with in, in, in the next months. And ISIS is getting more and more extreme. So like they were like, oh, now it's, we can kill people when they're 10 years old. We kind of put the stage at 12, now we lowered it down. Uh, and yeah, so, so we have to change all these conditions around the, the, the ones that created ISIS to, to calm things down. And that's gonna take, ISIS is not gonna go anytime soon. Uh, so you would uh, agree then that ISIS is a combination of uh, religious extremist fundamentalists combined with social, political, geopolitical, and economic issues? Yes, I do. Yes, I do. How can those of us who really, and I want to say I really admire and respect your courage and your principles, I mean, it takes a lot to do what you have done and other apostates from Islam have done. I left fundamentalism. That's piece of cake compared to what you guys have been through. That's a moderate version. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> How can we help? What's the best thing we can do? Is it money? Is it writing? What is it that we can do the most to help you? Send me an email. <laughs> okay. um, or uh, um, go, to, go to the project I'm working on, movements.org, which is about this question. That what can you do? If, if I'm, I'm going to interview at the moment. What skills do you have? <laughs> like, what skills do you think can be beneficial for the cause. Do you well, know editing? Do you, know sp do you speak different languages? Do you speak? I can write and I'm not afraid to, but I think more powerful is hearing people like yourself write who know where you're coming from and where you've been. Yes, and, and that's, um, I mean, one of the projects Secular Post that I worked on is to create that platform in which people of Rome class societies can publish their writings in an anonymously. I think it's, it's very important, but also I think things are better if, if they go through a movement, is that everybody stand up for everyone. For example, if, if, if somebody if from the Muslim world is writing and you have a blog that has a lot of large following, you can post that blog, post a Muslim blog to your fellow friends who can probably have the skills to help this guy. Like I'm gonna give you an example. The Bengali, if, I don't know if you're familiar with the recent Bengali shooting, uh, like the secular bloggers. And um, so here is how we helped. There was a, a guy who lives in Canada, actually, in Toronto, um, and who, who knows how to translate from, Ur from Bengali to English. So one of the Bengali bloggers sent us an article in, in, in Bengali. Then another person who doesn't even know both of these guys edited that article in English because he has editing skills. And then the Daily Beast, we, we have a partnership with, picked up the article and it became on the front page on the Daily Beast. Then they used that material, the blogger, to get to Sweden and now they're in Sweden. Did you, did you see the, the, the flow of the things? Is that three people who probably don't know each other at all, each one of them utilized their own skills, eventually lead to the conclusion that they escaped and they are safe right now. And this is one of the cases I worked on. And I can give you a lot of other cases that's, that follow the same transition, is that everybody can utilize their own skills Without, without probably having the whole solution. Like somebody can be legal help, somebody can be a graphic designer, they're all mixed together and produce a, a better conclusion. I call, it, I call that collective individualism, is that indi everybody is doing individual work collectively, they get a bigger, con better conclusion. This is something that, that's, that's the whole project is about, is getting people like yourself who are passionate, who want to help others to do something. Hi, uh, there's a, a quote of Christopher Hitchens about Islamophobia, and uh, I, I hate the word as much as you do. Uh, and when I use it, uh, people either say that's the greatest thing I've ever heard, or they call me an asshole. So what I, wanted, what I want to know from you is, can you tell me from your point of view, because obviously you're better prepared to, to answer the question, what I say to the people who think I'm an asshole for saying it, and the quote is, is that Islamophobia is a word created by fascists, used by cowards to ma manipulate morons. <laughs> yeah, I've, I've, uh, just a correction. Actually, this is not Hitchens' quote, but it was spread by Belmar as Hitchens' quote. Uh, and um, so it's actually from a guy on Twitter. He's like from Australia who, who, who made this tweet, and then Belmar picked it up thinking it was Christopher Hitchens. And I, I, but you would think Christopher Hitchens would say such thing. I mean, I totally would have guessed it. Um, yes, uh, that is actually a very... Um, like, and I actually, I went on a debate on Islamophobia about three weeks ago in Brooklyn, and you cannot imagine the level of security that was on that debate. 
uh, which kind of says the issue itself. And, and I raised the point, I said, in New York we have a show called the Book of Mormon, okay? And I said, can we do a Book of Islam in Broadway? <laughs> and um, ma many people w were, were obviously said no. And then, then I said, well, then you, then you admit that there is a special case with Islam. Because we can make fun of Mormonism 24-7 on Broadway, and yet we don't have security. We don't need to worry about our lives. We're not going to get blown up by Mitt Romney. Um, <laughs> and, uh, but, but there is a special, special case with Islam at the moment. But there, is, but there is a very important distinction to be made, is that there is such a thing, and I admit there is such, such a thing, as anti-Muslim bigotry. There is a difference between criticizing ideas and criticizing people, or hating or demonizing people. And I think that, that is a, it's a difficult to distinguish sometimes, but it's a very important distinction to be made. Is that, as I said, humans, Muslims, individuals who happen to be Muslims have rights, and they deserve equal rights in, this, in the West and everywhere. But Islam, Christianity, communism, capitalism, socialism, they're ideologies, they don't have rights, and they should be open to criticism, debates, and discussion. And, uh, what is, and, I, and during the debate, I was, I was actually pretty much talking to PR agencies. Like, they were just reading from the paper, you're all bigots, you're all racist, you're bad, anybody who criticizes Islam is bad and evil and the right redneck and whatever. And I was like, oh, I, I never thought that I'm a redneck. Um, <laughs> and, um, and yeah, so, so it's, it's, I think it's very important to, to distinguish these two and not to, uh, demonize mo all Muslims because they follow an ideology that is unreformed at the moment. What, what, what I really need to, what I really think need to be pushed for, uh, Anne Hirsa Ali used the word reformation, which I kind of disagree with. Islam doesn't need a reformation. It needs a modernization. Reformation, like uh, according to the Christian principle, is going back to pure Christianity without the Catholic Church. This is the last thing we want with Islam. The last thing we want with Islam is pure Islam. We need, to, we need to get away from that, like as, as furthest as we can get, like as, as further as we can get from pure Islam, the better. Um, and no Islam, uh, Islamic uh, Muhammad biography and so on, the further we get, the better. So it, what we need is more modernization, and that's what needs to be, uh, and, and um, if, if somebody is going to call you Islamophobic or something like this, tell them why are you applying different principles to Christians than to Muslims then you are the ones who's racist, not me. That's, that's my answer. You're the one who's racist who say, you know what? Oh, well, they can stone women because it's their culture. You're the one who's racist because you're assuming that just because somebody's like me, born and raised in the Middle East, somehow they are inferior to think that women are, are, deserve to be stoned to death. So, so it, is, it is the people on the left, in my opinion, the ones who call these, or the ones, the Islamists, are the ones who are racist. Are the ones who say, you know what, these people, just because they were born in that, they have different skin color, somehow they don't need to subscribe to liberal and, and secular values. These are the ones who are racist. And anybody who, who push, push, out, push out against the, the modernizations are the ones who want to keep the status quo. The ones who want to keep Islam at, as it is at the moment. The ones who want to keep the human rights violations that are still going on everywhere in the Muslim world. There are 13 countries, in, uh, there are 13 countries that execute people for being atheists. All of them are Muslim. All of them. And, 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 if, if, and they, they, why did they talk about atheist phobia? And that is a true atheist phobia. They're, they're killing them according to the law. So, so you, we, have, we have to be, as I said, we have to be adamant and, and, and un, on your face about it, like when it comes to this subject. And well, I don't think we can tolerate, like people say, oh, like Christianity took 300 years for reformation, let's wait for 300 years for Islam. I'm one of these people who don't think that we have the time. Because uh, we have, we live now in a very sophisticated world with a very sophisticated technology. And I grew up in Iraq, I grew up in the Civil War in which one asshole, I'll use the word asshole, uh, one asshole can kill 60, 70 people with an AK-47. It surely does it. People say, oh, well, like, why are you focusing on the radicals? Because the radicals are the ones who kill. And the radicals, if they have, imagine if the same people who did 9-11 had nuclear weapons. There would be no America today. 
And, and th so, so we don't really have the time to be like, let things go organically. I think people from California like that word, organically. Uh, <laughs> but uh, let, let, let things go organically. I don't think we have the time. We have to push for it. And we have to push as harder as we can. Thank you. You talked about uh, the real axis of evil being Saudi Arabia, Pakistan, and Iran. Could you just expand on that, your, your reasons for identifying those in particular? Yes. Um, Actually, I've written a lot about this, but it's, it's uh, Saudi Arabia ideology, the Saudi Arabia ideology, the Wahhabi ideology, it is Islamic reformation at work. And it is, it, and, and, and it is talking about going to pure Islam and going to fundamentalist Islam and, and so on. And it is spreading a lot through all over the world. Not only, like, we're seeing the results now in, in, in Iraq and Syria, but, but they also built madrasas in Pakistan and built madrasas in Bangladesh and built madrasas even here in the West, that they're trying to spread that ideology of violent jihad and, and so on. So, and cutting hands of thieves and stoning women for adultery and all of these kinds of stuff. So, Iran is the, is the Shia version, the opposite side of, Saudi Arabia, who also have, I mean, Iran kind of have more regional, uh, they want to have more regional power than they want to have a global power. They know, they know that they cannot successfully occupy the whole planet. Uh, and because Shias make up a minority in the, in the Muslim world, so they, they, they're, they're not gonna win the global war. But when you have the rest of the, of the, of the Muslims or mostly Sunnis, Saudi Arabia has a much bigger chance of winning the global war than Iran does. So Iran is mostly focusing on, on just helping those within the region, like the Shia government in Iraq, Bashar al-Assad in Syria, uh, and Hezbollah in Lebanon, sometimes they support Hamas, um, within, just within the region. So, and, and Pakistan, it is the only Muslim country with the nuclear weapons, and it is a failed state. And, and uh, it it's really worries me when you have a government that hardly controls most, most of the land that is supposed to claim that it, it's representing, um, has a nuclear weapons. It's, it's a really scary idea. And, and the idea that when you have the ISI, the is Pakistani intelligence, have been hand in hand with the Taliban, and they have, and, uh, like when, when the capturing of Osama bin Laden happened, the Americans did not inform the Pakistani intelligence because they were afraid they're going to tell bin Laden that the Americans are coming for you. And this is a country that has nuclear weapons. And that's what makes it, I, I think, probably is one of the top in, in terms of danger. Not, not the Pakistanis as people, like all of them, but, but the Taliban and the alliance that's happening between between their intelligence services and, and, and terrorist groups that are operating over there. And, and the Taliban was created by, that, by the Pakistani intelligence as a form to control Afghanistan. So, so that is, uh, that's why I think these countries are, are the most, fo we should most focus on. Hi there. I Hi. really uh, appreciate your analogy between um, the ideology being the disease and the group uh, or their actions being the, the outcome of that disease, the symptoms. Um, I wonder though, if, if you think about you know, the HIV AIDS analogy, and I'm not that kind of doctor, so maybe I'll screw this up, but uh, a lot of those are secondary infections. They're opportunistic. That the actions of those groups, does it really matter that it's religion? So if we, if we go to the theme of the conference, imagine no religion, would we actually get rid of extremism if we got rid of religion? Yes. Um, okay, it's, uh, well, <laughs> I mean, I, I think that, it, I mean, I, mean I, would, I would not make the claim that all the conflicts are a result of religion. Um, is that if you look at, like, for example, the Cold War, okay, it was not between Christianity and atheism. It was mostly about capitalism versus communism. Um, and so, so, I think that, that extremism, extremism itself is not the bad thing, in my opinion. It's the, it's extremism about bad ideas is the bad thing. Like if somebody is, is an extremist about programming, okay, or he's an extremist about 
some, some Hindu philosophies or Buddhist philosophies, like, oh, I'm extremist meditator. That's not really an issue, you know? <laughs> like, I, I, I'm, not, I'm not afraid, I, I don't think anybody is afraid or doesn't sleep, wake up at night if somebody is an uh, extremist uh, environmentalist or something like this. They're not going to flow planes into, into buildings. So, so as extremism itself, I don't think extremism is a problem. It's the ideas that they're extremist about. So, so I think it was Sam Harris who said, like the fundamentalist, the problem with Islamic fundamentalism is the fundamentals of Islam. So it's, it's really about what are you fundamentalist about is the problem. Like we, we yes, I mean, I mean, what, what I'm talking about a specific region like the Middle East. It is mostly about religion, but it doesn't have. It's not. It's not a global. Like sometimes it's not only about religion. Sometimes extremism came from. I mean, national socialism for example, has created lots of deaths. Communism has created lots of deaths. So it's, uh, so it's about the ideology itself, and we, we have to fight bad ideas, whatever we find them. So to be a hobby. They're saying that you should read the Quran and understand the Quran and understand the Hadith and understand the, the, the biography of the Prophet to become... So, so, so the, they, they can easily shift these moderates, as I said, the ones who belong to the spectrum, a way, like, because they're using the same language they're speaking. They're, so, so yes, I, I think that, that there is a big problem with the moderates themselves, is that the moderates are shifty, and they have not fully made up their mind, and, and the Wahhabi Saudi ideology has been successful by appealing to the main principle, and that is, uh, so unless that there is this modernization movement in support of more, D is, I, would, I would say more modern or different interpretation of Islam is that the, that the Quran is not the holiest or is, is not the literal word of the creator of the universe, I don't think that a solution is going to be made because the, because the Wahhabis are going to appeal to that principle and they, uh, they, they're always going to be successful. So we need to change this main thing that, that the Quran is not the holiest book and it needs to be open to reinterpretation so modernization can happen. Thank you. Thanks, Faisal. Awesome. Thank you.